There are so many astonishingly beautiful treasures in the city and suburbs, big and small, hidden and in plain sight. I'm Jeffrey Baer. In this program, people from all over the city and suburbs take me to the places they find most breathtaking. They share the stories of these places and why they're so meaningful. And I'll add to the list with some of my own favorites discovered over a quarter century of exploring Chicago. You'll see breathtaking vistas and divine details, finely crafted masterpieces and flights of fancy, castles for commerce and sacred spaces. Woven together, it's a tapestry that represents the rich diversity of Chicago. Join me as we explore the most beautiful places in Chicago. Lead support for The Most Beautiful Places in Chicago with Jeffrey Baer is provided by the Nagani Foundation. Lead corporate support is provided by BMO. Major support is provided by the Donna Van Eckeren Foundation. The Su Ling Jin Foundation Trust Fund. Matt and Joyce Walsh. The Susan and Stephen Baird Family Foundation. ITW and Strategic Growth and Transformation Partners, LLC. Additional support comes from Jamie Firth and these donors. When I fly, I always like to get a window seat. That won't be a problem on this flight. I'm get you in. I'm going to secure the plane from the outside. Okay. Seat bags and tray tables in there, upright and locked position. Correct. Nope. Hang on. Okay. Really, I'm not worried about a thing. Nope. We're in. Feeling great. I hope I remember how to fly this thing. Just in case. Our search for the most beautiful places in Chicago starts about an hour before sunset with pilot Gene Woods. He says if we time this just right, my window seat will reveal a view of the city that never fails to take his breath away. Dare I say, the time of the, all this? I think so. The sun is still up in the sky. Yeah. And here comes that beautiful sunset shot. Oh man, look at that. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh gosh. Is there anything more beautiful? That's beautiful. Man. That's gorgeous. Man. I'm glad I'm able to show it to you like this. I've never seen it this way before. This is a lot of fun, Jeffrey. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm having a ball, man. <laughs> Our dramatic and beautiful skyline got a new jewel in its crown in 2020. It's St. Regis Tower by renowned Chicago architect Jeannie Gang, known for using simple sculptural forms and subtle color to create beauty. And beauty is especially important here because this is the third tallest building in Chicago, visible from nearly everywhere. Where does your inspiration come from? Where do you start? I start from thinking from the inside out. So like how do you get more different kinds of light in, in an apartment from different directions. This started a little bit more like maybe we could taper the building in and out so that the three parts of it could go in and out of phase and, and, and have more corners. So mm -hmm. instead of four corners, the building has eight corners. Mm -hmm. The building block that made this possible is called a frustum. Essentially, it's a pyramid with the top chopped off. A lot of people have talked about it's a popcorn box, right? That's right. A popcorn box is a perfect shape of a frustum. <laughs> Has anyone built a model out of popcorn boxes? Well, in fact, yes. That was uh, one of the ways I used to study it when I was just, you know. Really? Yeah. Oh, because that's amazing. It's paper. It's they're inexpensive, but then they also give you, a, you know, you can eat a lot of popcorn and you can make a model. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All skyscrapers sway a bit in the wind, but the research showed this one would be so tall and slender 
that it would have swayed too much. So Studio Gang left a high, double-height floor open to the elements, allowing the wind to pass through the building instead of pushing against it. I can see why they call it a blow-through floor. It's windy up here. I'm not going to get too close. The rest of the floors, of course, have windows, offering spectacular views for the lucky few who can afford to live here. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to your new home in the sky. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let you just soak it in for you've, a little bit. You've done it. You've done it. What, so if I had to whip out my checkbook right now, what are we asking here? Oh, 19000000 million-ish. Hey, the bargain. <laughs> So, highest unit in Chicago? Highest unit in the city of Chicago. How about that? Nobody's, no, nobody's gonna block your view from here. Uh, how far can you see on a sunny day out there? On a sunny day, you can see the great state of Michigan. Unbelievable. Okay, bathroom with a 14-foot ceiling. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you, are you a music fan? Yeah. You could watch Lollapalooza from your bathtub. <laughs> the bathtub with the best view in Chicago. So when you're doing skyscrapers in Chicago, which we like to boast is the birthplace <laughs> of the skyscraper, what do you think about working in this town? Oh, well, I think it's, it's kind of an architect's dream, frankly, because Chicagoans like tall buildings. I think because maybe because we don't have a mountain landscape or some <laughs> other hills or thing, but it, 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 the architecture really is the landscape. It's what we're known for in Chicago. And, and there's this adventurous spirit. Jeannie Gang comes from a long line of renowned architects who've made Chicago a global leader in skyscraper design. From some of the world's very first skyscrapers, pioneered by Chicago architects at the turn of the 20th century, to austere modernist masterpieces by Chicago's own Mies van der Rohe, who famously said, less is more, and transformed architecture around the world. And highly original gems from every era. Tribune Tower from 1925 was the winning design in a competition to create nothing less than the most beautiful building in the world. The paper's grandiose publisher, Colonel Robert McCormick, offered $100,000 in prize money. More than 200 entries poured in. Many were startlingly modern, but the winner by John Mead Howells and Raymond Hood of New York was inspired by a medieval cathedral. It was converted to condos in 2021, but it's still a monument to journalism. Just ask Melissa Hubert Degra, who greets residents and visitors in the lobby, which still looks just as it did in 1925. <laughs> Wow, I'm kind of in awe. <laughs> so what do you call this space? <laughs> this is the Hall of Inscription, where the inscriptions give a nod to the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. We have people that come from all over the world who don't have those freedoms. And so we here um, sometimes take it for granted, but it's really important that we're reminded. And here it is inscribed into the walls since 1925. So it's absolutely fantastic to have it as a reminder that how important that it is. So one of my favorite quotes is right here, inscripted on the floor. On the floor? Yes. It's by John Ruskin. OK. And this beautiful quote is admirably explains on why this building is here. Therefore, when we build, let us think that we will build forever. And let us think as we lay stone on stone that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred, and that men will say, as they look upon the labor and the wrought substance of them, see this our fathers did for us. Isn't that awesome? Cue the violins. <laughs> In addition to the inscriptions, the lobby features this enormous relief map. It symbolizes the Tribune's wide coverage, but Melissa says it's special for another reason. It's not only because of its sheer size, Jeffrey, it's because of what it's made out of. What it's made out of? Yes. Like how it's fabricated? Yes. It's made out of decommissioned US currency. What? Yes. <laughs> Legend has it took over one million single dollar bills to create. It's paper mache and plaster. 
It adds new meaning to the term throw money at it. <laughs> <laughs>
not just for people outside of the community, but most importantly for those that live there, that they feel like something has been almost gifted to them. I really want everyone to know what's going on in this building. That here you have a university that's investing in immigrants, inspiring immigrants to attain higher education. That's a story that needs to be heard. The Merchandise Mart is big and famous, but is it one of the most beautiful places in Chicago? Well, I'd say after dark it is. That's when the walls come alive with a delightful and ever-changing projected display of digital art by a variety of artists called Art on the Mart. During one two-month period, Art on the Mart featured the work of Chicago multimedia artist Nick Cave, who's most famous for his sound suits. What's the story behind these wearable works of art? I got the answer from the artist himself when I visited a major retrospective of his work in 2022 at the Museum of Contemporary Art. When you're wearing some of these, can you see out of them? All of them. Even, All of them. Even that one. There. Oh, really? You put like little holes? Well, you know, the opening in here uh -huh. is all mesh screen. Yeah. And so I could see out. You can't see in. Yeah. And so that's also something I'm interested in that, you know, I can, you know, move through the world with this filter. Yeah. Cave's sound suits seem playful but he was inspired to start creating them in response to a horrible event. The original idea came from uh, the Rodney King um, incident. And it was really me as a young sort of black man really struggling with trying to sort of reckon with just what I was encountering. And, uh, and I happened to be sitting in Grant Park and I looked down and there was this twig and I don't know, I started collecting all the twigs in the park. And so this twig made me sort of think about something that was dismissed, discarded. I took these materials home, then made what I thought was a sculpture, but didn't even think that I could wear it. And then the moment I put it on my body and moved, it made sound. Yeah. And so then that led me to think about protest. In order to be heard, you gotta speak louder. What does that feel like to see your art occupy two and a half acres? I think for me, I'm thinking more about the sort of accessibility of it. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that, you know, I'm always thinking about like ways of getting the work into the world. I think, you know, that becomes this beacon for the two and a half months that it's up. This is for the community. So much of your work is imbued with um, social justice and really these really difficult issues in our society, racism, and, um, and yet they're, they seem so joyful. You know, I think that that's life. You know, it's, 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 you know, and how do you balance that, you know, in spite of the despair and, uh, the sort of injustice, there's also optimism, hope. I'm still dreaming. Some find an awesome kind of beauty in this region's history as an industrial powerhouse. Where heavy industry has declined, some industrial remains have been reborn to beautify Chicago. This former quarry and landfill in Bridgeport is now Palmasano Park, named for the proprietor of a local bait shop. Designing the park was a new challenge for renowned landscape architect Ernie Wong. What was this place before it was a park? What's the history? The history of this place, it used to be a uh, limestone quarry. So this was really a hole like 300 feet deep. That was how deep it is. We have 300 feet? 300 feet deep. 
there was a, it was a sheer wall just straight down and it was absolutely it was absolutely incredible and then uh, when the city ended up taking it over they ended up using it as a landfill for construction debris clean dis uh, construction so not like um, not banana peels not banana peels yeah. and that kind like of thing. like construction yeah waste. construction uh, debris and they kept on filling it and filling it and filling it for almost 20 years until we got hold of it and um, and created a park and so was was that was everything kind of arranged this way or did you shovel some stuff up oh there was a lot of grading yeah so what'd you do we kind of cordoned it off into different um sections of the park there's an athletic field up top uh -huh. and knowing full well that there's such grade changes uh throughout here we formulated this mound so uh, you made that mountain. Yeah, we made the, the we made uh, Mount Bridgeport, and that's and that's construction debris under there. That was construction there? debris under that, and and then kind of tapered it out down. So there is a wetland that goes from uh, Halstead Street down to this pond. So uh -huh. it takes the water, and we terrace it all the way down here. I can and see then, the water flowing down. Exactly, here. and then uh, the mound itself has is mostly prairie, so it's this environmental. Uh, park mm -hmm. on top of the landfill. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean to like be able to take a an old industrial site and repurpose it? it, it it's actually very invigorating. I think it's really important and that builds community. Do you ever come out and, or, or have you come out and like seen how people use the park? Absolutely. And do you, what do you learn from that? <laughs> what do you think? It's always an adventure. Uh, we never know how people are going to use the park, uh, any of the parks. And so when you, we talk about desire lines and how people kind of move through the park. Wait, what'd you call that? Desire lines. Desire or, lines. <laughs> or like cow paths. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you mean people forge their own paths? Forge their own weren't... paths throughout the, okay. the park. And, and it becomes a trail. And, uh, and, and it just becomes part of how they own the park. And, and I think it's wonderful to see that. In Chinatown, Ernie transformed another abandoned industrial site, a former rail yard along the Chicago River, into Ping Tom Park. It brings open space and a beautiful natural area to a community that had no parks for generations. The community wanted the park to remind them of their Chinese heritage, which gave Ernie a chance to connect with his own roots. So what is this structure that we're standing in? So this is a Chinese pavilion. Um, Actually, after going to China for the first time in my life in uh, the 1990s, this was really inspirational for me to see that classical Chinese architecture and to embody that within this park as part of uh, embracing this community. And so uh, this was really uh, something that really made me think about who I am as a, as a Chinese American, uh, what my heritage is, what I came from. I think there's a lot of pride with this community of, of they're away from home. There's, there's a huge immigrant community. And when they come to this park, they feel this is part of home and, and where I feel comfortable. But when Ernie showed the park to his father, the noted Chinese-born modernist architect, Y.C. Wong, well, I'll let Ernie tell you how that went. And what did your father think of it? <laughs> my, father was, my father was not very happy about this. He had spent his entire life in China understanding this classical Chinese architecture, but coming to America to learn something new from Mies van der Rohe. Modernism. Uh, modernism, right. exactly. This is not modernism. And this is not modernism. Uh, uh -huh. He was not particularly happy. But it is what the community wanted. Yeah. And yeah. so. And have you seen them embrace it? This is now the site of many weddings because people come here uh, to, to get their pictures taken. They feel that this is the quality of who they are as Chinese Americans in Chicago's Chinatown. On the far south side, this sprawling parcel of vacant lakefront land was home to a steel mill called Southworks from the 1800s until it closed in 1992. On a small part of the site, a new park gives residents in the community of South Chicago access to our beautiful lakefront for the first time in more than a century. 
This sculpture on the site honors the Union steel workers who labored here and their families. The artist who created it, Roman Villarreal, was once a steel worker himself. I came to work in the mill in 1967. And so you were, I mean, this was a, a steel mill. Oh yeah, like right now. Like where, can you show me like point to where you used to work? Well, I, I used to work on the docks, which, which basically behind us, the boats would come in from that angle over there. My job at the time, I was a laborer, and my job was basically to keep it safe, clean the area. So it was, it was interesting. But my father put me in there because I was having too much fun on the street. He said, you're going to work. <laughs> How old were you? 17. You came here at 17? At, at, well, at 17, 16, if your parents signed you, you could come to work in the mill, 3 to 11. That was the main shift for us at that age. You know? And we lived across the street from the steel mill. I remember always noise. Noise was a very dominant thing in this community. Clanging, banking, I mean, the trucks, so constant. But it was a positive world in the community too, right? The oh, of course, because that was money. It was one of the main things that everybody in this community had pocket money. So it was a different atmosphere because everybody had money. There was no, uh, it was, it was uh, a happy time. And people started buying cars, started buying homes. I always tell people that we almost got to middle class. Almost. Almost. Then the, they hit the fan and everybody else, next thing you know, foreclosure. They came for your car. The mill clothes. Yeah, the mill clothes. And it just, the world changed for everybody, you know? What does this park mean to the community? Or what does it say about the future or where the community might be going? Well, the, the main important part of this park, above all, is that we were here. A steel worker. In other words, there was a, a group of people that came here and believed in the steel dream. That was their whole world. This mill. This mill was their bed and butter. This was their retirement. This is what they were proud of. See, you could be an average person out there, but the minute you stepped in the mill, you were somebody important because you were the steel worker. So how did you land on this idea for the sculpture, this design? My idea for this sculpture was when the mill closed, I always wanted to leave a mark. So what does it say? What does it mean What to you? Well, the steel workers always to me was family. I could have gone over here and did a steel worker with a sledgehammer and somebody working on that, but that's really not what the mill was about. The mill was family, because every man that worked in the steel mill was a family man. The only remnants of the enormous steel mill that once stood here are these towering ore walls, where ships once unloaded raw materials for steel making. They were just too big to tear down. They're like man-made mountains, complete with beautiful mountaintop views as long as you're a mountain climber. Why do I need special shoes? Uh, Jeffrey, they're not necessarily special shoes, but you can see all the grip kind of on, on not just where uh -huh. you're used to seeing it underneath, but on the outside. Right. So it just creates way more surface area for you to- I'm all about to, surface uh, area. Twist and turn your feet there to get good grip there. So yeah. uh, they're pretty easy to put on. Again, uh, they might be a little snug. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe even a little more- Good grip sounds good to, to me. But they shouldn't hurt. All right, let's see. Oh yeah, they are tight. That's good. The tighter, the better. So we're going to have that nice and tight. OK, <laughs> nice and tight there. Yeah. Yeah, so we want the helmet to be on uh, just snug enough that it shouldn't come off uh, if you were to go upside down the way you just did. Go and upside no down? Nice. Yeah, well, I'm going upside just, down. Just the way you did now. So I don't little... intend to go upside down. I didn't really like what he said about upside down. <laughs> it doesn't look this tall until you get up here. The Rookery Building in the heart of Chicago's business district has a surprise inside. On the outside, it's all heavy stone. But after you enter and pass the elevators, you emerge into a beautiful space so light and airy, you almost feel like you've gone back outdoors. There are all sorts of reasons to make a place beautiful, here, at least part of the idea behind the beauty was the bottom line. 
according to Pulitzer Prize-winning architecture critic Blair Kamen. When you have these big floors, you really need to bring natural light and air into the building in order to make it rentable, in order to make money. In the mid-1880s, electric light and gas light were very primitive. So that's the functional reason behind this space. But obviously, the original architects, Daniel Burnham and John Root, and then later, Frank Lloyd Wright, elevated that functional need into something truly extraordinary. So above this ceiling is sort of a hollow space so that the interior offices get light. Yeah, light and air. And air. Don't forget air, no air conditioning oh. in those days. You know, air conditioning doesn't really become a factor in, in office buildings until after World War II. Mm -hmm. So if you want to rent space and make money, you've got to deal with those practical things. I mean, art is, you know, art, the artful architecture is nice, but the bottom line counts too. Yeah, well, I think you're making a point there. You know, that there's something very Chicago about the practicality behind all this beauty, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the story of Chicago architecture elevating the pragmatic into the artistic. That's what Chicago architects are so skilled at doing. For busy office workers who didn't want to wait for the primitive elevators, architects Burnham and Root elevated the utilitarian spiral stairway into a work of art. The rookery might have seemed beautiful in 1888, but less than 20 years after it opened, it was already looking dated bad for business. Originally, this is like a Victorian birdcage that uh, John Root of Burnham and Root designs. By 1905, tenants were looking for the next big thing. So the rookery hired hotshot architect Frank Lloyd Wright to give the lobby a facelift. You really see Wright's hand here and the way he modernized the space while being respectful to Root's mm -hmm. original. It, Wright added characteristic Wrightian touches. Uh, urns, Brendan Gill, the critic, once accused Wright of urnomania. <laughs> um, he loved urns. He loved urns, and he brings nature into the space atop oh, yeah, the urns, sure. right? So that's, that's Wrightian. But also, he uses the marble yeah. uh, incised with gold, with the Arabic motif to lighten and animate. Wright is, you know, simplifying and he's making it geometric and it, it connects to the past and yet it also anticipates the future. Wright was brilliant and what he did, you know, elevated the space even further. It made it, you know, it accentuated its lightness, its airiness, its ethereal qualities, its contrast with the exterior. It brought it into the 20th century, literally. Another place where beauty was meant to attract and keep customers? Marshall Field's legendary State Street store, now Macy's. Soaring above the cosmetics counters is the world's largest Tiffany mosaic. Completed in 1907, this iridescent 6,000 square foot vault with more than a million pieces of dazzling glass took a team of artisans 18 months to complete. At the Elks Memorial in Lincoln Park, the beauty was meant to honor members of this fraternal organization who lost their lives serving their country in battle. It's like stepping into a time machine and emerging inside the Pantheon in ancient Rome. Except the adjoining room is full on Louis XIV Versailles. South Shore Cultural Center was created to surround members of this former exclusive country club in opulence. It was designed by the architect of the Chicago elite and high society party animal, Benjamin Marshall. The club excluded Jews, blacks, and others even as the neighborhood became a Jewish enclave and then majority black. After the club closed, the Chicago Park District converted it to a beloved resource for all to enjoy. Including Barack and Michelle Obama, who held their wedding reception there. Many religions use transcendent beauty to inspire faith. 
like here at the stunning BAPS Hindu house of worship called a mandir in West Suburban Bartlett. So what's a mandir? So mandir is a Hindu spiritual place of worship. And mandir literally translates to where the mind becomes still. I know if maybe if I were Hindu, my mind would be still. But right now, my mind is going in a million places. I mean, there's so much to look at. There's a lot to look at. There's really intricate carvings. And of course, in the center, where your focus really comes to is yeah. towards the shrine of Bhagwan, or God, and his ideal devotee. So an ideal devotee is a devotee who's closest to God. And we try to live our lives according to his actions, his values. What, what are those, just in brief? Service, unity, humility, uh, prayer, you know, and constantly um, thinking about ways to improve yourself and live your best life. And do you do that? I try to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're all human, but we certainly get inspired by our spiritual leaders. We believe that God manifests through these images. They're not just, you know, pictures. They're not just us, images of stone. And we really believe that God is live and here amongst us. And so you're sort of surrounded by holiness? We are. We try to see God in each other too, right? We see the light in each other. There is built on the Shilpa Sastras, which is the ancient Hindu scripture of the art of architecture. And so... Oh, I like that, the a, art of architecture. <laughs> it's an engineering marvel. Yes. And um, so no steel has been used, but all these pieces have been interlocked like a jigsaw puzzle. And this one stone helps support. It's the final piece that goes into... Uh, oh, like a keystone. Like a keystone. And it holds and supports the rest of these pillars. And this was all hand carved? Yes, hand carved in India. In India? In India. And shipped here? Yes, and shipped here. And uh, how many people did it take to carve all of Thousands this? of artisans who are skilled in this art form for, for decades. Spectacular or subtle, beauty is an element of virtually every sacred space. The lacy dome of the Baha'i House of Worship in North Suburban Wilmette is so intricate and delicate, it's hard to believe it's made from concrete infused with sparkling quartz. Baha'i, embracing faiths worldwide, was introduced to America at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. This breathtaking Byzantine-style synagogue is home to Chicago's oldest Jewish congregation, Kehilat Anshe Ma'arav, or K-A-M, founded in 1847, just 10 years after the city was incorporated. K-A-M merged with Temple Isaiah Israel in 1971 and moved into Isaiah Israel's magnificent building dating from 1924, designed by prominent Chicago architect Alfred Allshuler who was himself Jewish. The architect used bricks of different shades and colors to suggest old sun-baked walls, according to the AIA Guide to Chicago Architecture. In West Suburban Streamwood, Beitel Ilm Mosque serves a community of predominantly Shia Muslim families. The design of the building, which opened in 2011, takes its inspiration from an Islamic narrative that God loves beauty. In fact, one of God's names, Jamil, means beautiful. The beauty begins right at the front entrance with its intricate tile work and continues into the breathtaking domed prayer space. <laughs> Human images are not used to ornament Islamic houses of worship. Instead, Quranic verses and the names of God's messengers in highly artistic calligraphy adorn the interior. 
Images of biblical figures and events are central to Eastern Rite churches like Saints Volodymyr and Olha Ukrainian Catholic Church in West Town. These sacred images, called icons, are not considered works of artistic expression. Instead, they serve as a bridge between the earthly and the divine. The devout iconographers who create them adhere to a thousand-year-old tradition of design and never sign their work. The design of the church building itself is symbolic, with the western end representing the darkness of the unredeemed world and the east filled with light beneath the dome and the crown-like chandelier with a glorious carved oak screen at the altar called an iconostasis. It's not always easy to keep a place looking beautiful. This is one of nine Tiffany windows at Second Presbyterian Church in the South Loop being removed for restoration a few years ago. Careful, guys. Second Presbyterian is renowned for its collection of exceptional stained glass windows. It's a legacy from the days when this congregation included wealthy Chicago families with names like Pullman and Armour, who lived just blocks away on the street of millionaires, South Prairie Avenue. After a devastating fire destroyed the neo-Gothic interior of the church in 1900, architect Howard Van Doren Shaw rebuilt it in the cutting edge arts and crafts style of the day. And I'm happy to report that Tiffany's so-called peace window now glows like new after a painstaking $320,000 restoration thanks to a nonprofit group dedicated to preserving and restoring this national historic landmark building. Our Lady of Sorrows in East Garfield Park, completed in 1902, is one of three basilicas in Chicago's Catholic Archdiocese. A basilica is a church designated by the Pope for its historical, artistic, or religious significance. The Chicago Architecture Center called this Renaissance Revival Church maybe the grandest in Chicago. Some have called Unity Temple in Oak Park Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece. Wright wowed visitors from the moment they entered with an age-old architectural trick called compression and release. We entered the lobby from outside and we're already being compressed yeah, down I mean, into the space. Look how low that is. Now as we're entering the cloister, the ceilings get lower and yeah, darker. I can almost touch it. Yeah, and it's compressing you down. And then go ahead. Okay. You get released into the sanctuary. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> and Frank Lloyd Wright called this his noble room. So you're being you know, risen up almost to nobility and it just opens right up and yeah. So much to look at. The noble room? The noble room. That sounds like Frank Lloyd Wright. It does, yes, it does. <laughs> Modesty. <laughs> Very modest man, yeah. <laughs> and what year was this built? So it was finished in 1908. 1908. And, uh, he designed it more in 1906. So let's put that in context. Like, what do houses of worship look like in 1908? Well, it's probably what a lot of them look like today, more Gothic, you know, more traditional steeples. Um, heavy, you know, stone and mosaics, but uh, the minister at the time, he wanted something different and to reflect the Unitarian values and ideals of community. So how does this reflect Unitarianism? Well, as you can see, we are here in the round. Um, the seating is uh, not your traditional church yeah. seating of front to back pews. So that way you can see people that you're communing with and um, community is, is really important in Unitarianism. So talk about the materials in here. You know, it's, it's not a, a typical color palette for a house of worship, I don't think, right? Here, he really wanted to bring nature in. And he said he wanted the sanctuary to feel like it was a happy, cloudless day at any point in time. The soft yellow that he brings in really reflects the light. And I love how he brings the light in because we don't have any windows that are at human eye level. Right. So with the clear story windows, you get a lot of indirect light. Up at the top. Up at, and then of course the beautiful stained glass windows in the ceiling, there's 25 of them filter light down. And that's supposed to represent um, nature and like an abstracted flower. So while you're standing here, you can almost feel like you're sitting underneath, you know, a field of flowers. 
So the outside of the building is made of? Concrete. And that was very revolutionary, right? It was. Unity Temple is one of the first public buildings to use concrete in, in this way. It was poured in place. And then when we moved to the inside, there is some concrete, but also plaster. Yeah. And there is a whole technique that he used of um, creating texture in the plaster. Uh -huh. And when he painted it, you could see, especially once you get up to the ceiling, lights and darks and a yeah. kind of stippled finish. And it really is almost suede-like. Even in the skylight well, there, you can really see it. Absolutely. Wright lived and worked in Oak Park for 20 years. The village has more Wright buildings than any place in the world. His prairie style matured here, as did his reputation for arrogance. He could rightfully claim to be the greatest architect of his day, but not the greatest at engineering durability into his designs. The years took their toll on Unity Temple, by 2000, it was named one of the 10 most endangered buildings in Illinois. This building is pretty difficult to maintain, you know, like a, a lot of large buildings, but being that there's a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. A lot buildings. of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, <laughs> yes. In fact, um, a, I think it was a few years before the restoration, a big such a section of the ceiling had fallen. So there was a lot of patching. Um, and then more aesthetically, a lot of the paint wasn't quite right. All this beautiful stippling and the texture had been painted over so many times. What was done in the in the course of the restoration? Um, yeah, if you can imagine, this whole building was wrapped in plastic and scaffold everywhere. Every single piece of trim work was removed and cataloged and refinished and reinstalled. It ended up being about $25 million to do the full comprehensive restoration. With restoration completed, Unity Temple was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site, along with seven other Wright buildings across the country, putting it in a league with the Egyptian pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and the Vatican. Whether it's the clean modern lines of Frank Lloyd Wright and Jeannie Gang, or the over-the-top opulence of styles from history, there's more beauty in the Chicago area than we could possibly fit in one program. From artfully crafted landscapes, to surprising hidden gems, to breathtaking views of arguably the most beautiful skyline in the world. So get out there and do your own exploring and let us know your picks so we can add them to our list of the most beautiful places in Chicago and share them with the world. Lead support for The Most Beautiful Places in Chicago with Jeffrey Baer is provided by the Nagani Foundation. Lead corporate support is provided by BMO. Major support is provided by the Donna Van Eckeren Foundation. The Su Ling Jin Foundation Trust Fund. Matt and Joyce Walsh. The Susan and Stephen Baird Family Foundation. ITW and Strategic Growth and Transformation Partners, LLC. Additional support comes from Jamie Firth and these donors.